Hi everybody, my name is Rachel Harris. I am founder of Accountant She and co-founder of Strivex Accountants, which is one of the UK's fastest scaling accountancy practice. Um, I'm a disruptor in the accounting industry and so I am disrupting what it means to be an accountant, disrupting what it feels like to have an accountant and disrupting what being an exceptional employer of accountants looks like as well. So I bring value to my audience by creating long and short form content, which is free, consumable and accessible to increase the financial education of those who need it the most. Uh, in today's episode, we are going through the story of Accountant Chief. Welcome to the story of a show about founders, innovators, entrepreneurs and the stories behind the businesses, technology and movements they have built. I'm Phil Hobden and on the show today, I'm joined by Rachel Harris, an award winning content creator, author, speaker, business owner and accountant as we dive into the story of Accountant She. So Rachel, I guess I'm going to start with um, a big question, right? a broad question. Where did the idea of Accountant She come from? Good question. Um, accountant She was very, very much a start with why concept. And for me, we before we hit record, we just had a, a very brief conversation about where I grew up. Uh, because Phil went to university in the same place at the same time that I grew up uh, in Carlisle. And for me, I grew up with two parents. One parent was a full-time parent. The other parent didn't go to school, couldn't read and write, and had a vocational career as a welder and fabricator. So because of that, I had one parent um, not in full-time employment, another parent who couldn't read or write and was illiterate until his 40s. And so because of that, financial education... Finances in general wasn't something that was discussed on our dining room table. It definitely, I was raised with a mindset of you can be what you can see. And so that definitely sort of like put tunnel vision on me, blinkers in terms of what I could achieve and what I could do. And so through that careers advisors with, with somebody who had a very natural um, affliction towards maths. I absolutely loved maths, could not get enough of maths and rules and numbers. Uh, a careers advisor told me not to become an accountant because it was boring and I had people skills. Um, and so throughout my journey, there were a few um, uh, obstacles, but you know, small ones, nothing, nothing too huge for me, but obstacles that actually, if somebody else, a couple of steps ahead of me had been creating content about what it was like to be an accountant, going on podcasts to talk about what it was like to be an accountant, sharing their journey, sharing their story through industry practice, starting a business, becoming self-employed, showing the impact that you can have as an accountant on that, my life would have been hugely different. I then went on, I didn't go to university, I trained through apprenticeships. And so in the firms that I worked in, there was very, very limited female leadership. I trained, did most of my training at a top 75 practice where there was one female leader uh, and they wouldn't make her partner because she didn't work full time. Um, and so for me, having access to really strong female leadership was always really important to me. And so accountant, she literally was created to fill that gap. I believe that if, if what you needed didn't exist when you needed it, you should build it blow the doors open and hold them open for those who come after you. Um, and so I feel like accountant, she as a vibe is the accountancy big sister. It's not the finished model. I'm not an accountancy parent. I'm an accountancy big sister who is learning with you, creating content and just trying to guide you in, in that direction. And so accountant, she came from my huge need for this sort of content. I mean, there's so much to unpack in that, in that answer. Um, let's go, I guess, let's go down the, 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 the route of the success from that, right? Like, I've seen over the last three events, so if you look kind of Accountex North, no, sorry, it would have been Accounting Web Live to Accountex, to Accounting, Accountex Manchester, you've become quite a key figure in some of these events, right? Like, like, a lot of them, and, and with the upcoming, as we record this, uh, they would have happened when this episode goes out, but the upcoming Accounting Excellence Awards as well yep. are, are like pink branding everything. The impact you've had in a short space of time has been phenomenal. Mm. Why has it landed so well with an industry that historically has been not the most diverse, but it's definitely making it much, right? But why do you think it's landed so well? And why do you think it's been established so quickly? Yeah, the reason it's been so successful has absolutely nothing to do with me. 
it has everything to do with how desperately the industry needed it. Um, I, we always say like as employers, we're doing great things. As a practice, we're doing great things. We've scaled from zero to one million within three years. We're not doing anything differently. We're actually doing how it should have been done the whole time, which is be a great person, lead with your heart, be honest, show the vulnerabilities. I think that in finance, very often people struggle to show. People struggle to drop their guard and are made to feel like you have to be knowing what direction you're going in and how to get there. Whereas the reality is like, we're accountants. The rules change every April. It's okay to not have any idea what you're doing. And the more people that speak openly about that, the more welcoming this will be as an industry. And actually we then solve that recruitment crisis. But the reason Accountant She has escalated from me starting an Instagram account three years ago to now having an audience of over 40,000 in three years has happened because it was so desperately needed. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think I think you 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 established that really well. Um and like I said, the feedback has been phenomenal. Like seeing you at events and creating content with accountants, you've been on two panels that I've hosted at events. And I mean, I'm gonna boldly say that they've they've definitely been two of the buzziest and busiest panels at both events. Yeah. So absolutely that vibe and, and, and what you're doing is resonating with the industry. And clearly you're right, it's because it's needed that it's it's people have connected with it. How do you evolve that to keep it going, right? Because there's, there's going to be a point where, and it happens a lot in this industry, where people go, "Oh, that was yesterday's thing, right?" It's mm. never going to be yesterday's thing. It's still important. But how are you? Yeah. What's your kind of thought process on keeping that fresh and at the front of people's mind, so that message doesn't get diluted over whatever comes next? Uh, yeah, I love that question. That's that's a really good question. Um, so for me, my north star. Um, which is the long-term vision for Accountant She. And it's worth saying, if, if anyone's not encountered the brand before, Accountant She not only is an online platform that, that serves accountants, uh, so I create, create content by, about, and for accountants, but also it's the pipeline into our practice, which, again, we've scaled from zero to a million pounds within three years. And so it does multiple things. And so from my perspective, the more monetization opportunities, again, just before we hit record on this podcast, I was about to ask Phil, so who are you going to get to sponsor this podcast? Like get a sponsor before it goes live. Don't do a pilot series. Just go straight in. Uh, like who can I introduce you to? And so for me, monetizing every single content pillar on the platform has been really important to me to allow me with the brain space, the head space and the financial capacity to do more and impact more. So at the beginning of 2023, I launched the first ever corporate bursary scheme, which fully funds somebody over the next three years of their life who can't access financial education because of financial restrictions. Um, in the last nine months, I've been working with her one to one. She started flying through her exams and she actually last week landed her first job in practice because I was able to find a practice owner who needed somebody like her and she's incredible. And so next year, because of the monetization opportunities that I am engaging with within Accountant She, next year's goal is to launch 10 bursaries. And so it's much less about how you're going to keep this trending the whole time and much more about how can you generate wider impact with the resources that you are generating? Because there is not one piece of content. There's not one element to what I do in Accountant She that isn't monetized in some way. And so for me, that's about impact, not finances. It's about who, how can we get this information to everybody who needs it the most? To a lot of accountants listening to this, they are going to be, some of this will be double dutch. Some of, some of this will mean absolutely nothing, right? Like monetization and all of this. And they're like, yeah, but I'm an accountant. I, I talk to my clients. I, I help them solve their problems. I deal with their compliance. Um, there is a huge step change in the industry and it's been creeping for years and it's it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger where accountancy isn't just about the software you use and, and, and the practice that you have, it's everything else around that. What would you say to someone that, that, that looks at this and goes, well, this is, it's overwhelming to think about all of this, right? Where do I start? How do I get started? Because it's a hell of a journey to get to where you've done in, in three years and, and even longer for someone that's not maybe quite as savvy to that yeah. journey. Yeah, people don't wake up one day and start creating multiple forms of long and short form content on multiple platforms. They do exactly what I did, which is start in one place with one outcome. 
So I started on Instagram during the pandemic with the only goal of finding clients. James and I, I run the business with my husband, James. We'd just taken our first mortgage and thought it was a great time to quit our jobs. And so I started on Instagram with the goal of finding clients. And that was it. It has evolved and grown into this incredible community. But again, it has huge monetization opportunities. And I think I'm quite unique in the fact that I run a chartered accountancy practice, but I also have an MBA, which is a master's in business. Um, I did that as an exec. So I was working full time at the same time as doing doing a master's in business. And that really blew the doors off in terms of me. I think lots of us as accountants see the word accountant as a full stop. If you're introducing yourself at a networking event and you say you're an accountant, no one says, oh, what's that? Or if you say I'm an accountant, like it's always been a full stop for me, whereas actually doing an MBA and bringing in sort of like having diversity within the qualifications that we have as a practice um, has done great things for me as a person, because I actually realized I am an accountant, but I think I became an accountant because I love business. I love numbers and I love helping people. And so actually, how can I how can I use this to be more strategic? And in a lot of the talks that I do at the shows, because of what I've done, a lot of it is about personal branding. And one of the main talking points from my side is every single thing, whether it's a LinkedIn post, an Instagram story that disappears within 24 hours, or long form content that is evergreen that you you can consume over the next 10 years, every single bit of content, every single outfit that I wear, every single word that I say is intentional. I think there is a misconception, especially around the, my brand is I do a serious job. I don't take myself too seriously, right? You'll see me dancing on TikTok and doing funny things. It's intentional. It's not a, it's not a naive younger practice owner just dancing around being silly. It's intentional. It's strategic. And so different pieces of content do different things for me, my business, my brand, whether it's we've just hit 120 members of staff on our employee waiting list. Actually, the more engaging trending content attracts those people talking about clients who've just won Bake Off, been on Strictly Come Dancing or been on Love Island attracts those staff. And so I promise every bit of content you ever see from me is intentional. And actually, as a young female who is constantly uh, sort of underestimated, that's my superpower because people don't even realize that you're doing it. That's that's so true. And so I guess I want to talk a little bit about the waiting list and, and that because like the industry is facing a huge recruitment challenge. I've interviewed people about this. I've talked to kind of HR teams in, in some bigger firms and recruiters and, and everything. And so, so there's a huge challenge in the industry right now. And you're doing, you've got the exact opposite challenge where n you've almost got too many people, like 120 people on a waiting list is, is, is insane. Why is that? Why? Obviously you're doing something very different and that's, that's attracting people, but there's more to it than just TikTok, right? It's the culture you've built in the business. Yeah. So talk, talk a little bit maybe about the, the, the culture you've built and why that's attracting the, the, the level of candidate that it is. So we, we do have uh, a very different culture. We do have um, an exceptional benefits package. Like I built the benefits package. I built the business that I deserved and that I wanted to work for when I was you know earning minimum wage <laughs> as an apprentice accountant. And so we do do things differently. We put our money where our mouth is. I'd much rather have a stable team that can generate more future profit than profit tomorrow by employing people on minimum wage, not giving them benefits package and then having to replace them and pay recruitment fees every six months. So we are doing something different. I'd say the biggest thing that we do differently is appropriately prioritize how important it is to speak about it openly online and to consider attracting new members of staff as important as attracting new clients. I'd say that's probably the biggest thing that we do differently is every single piece of content is either attracting new clients or attracting new members of staff. Most people only start recruiting when they need to hire and you're already six months too late. So right now it is um, September 23, so at the end of September 23, we have got pre-dated or pre-accepted offer letters extending as far out as March 2024. So we've got people who are in employment only on one month's notice, they've accepted an offer letter, and from that point onwards we have really open communication in terms of the pipeline of new clients that we've got coming in, um, any internal promotions that might be happening, and so we've said to that person, 
all the, the multiple people between now and March 2024. Um, we'll keep the dialogue really, really open. And then once once we get to one month's notice, you hand your notice in, we'll start getting ready for you and you start working. So we're now at the point where we've got a six month runway of offers accepted, which then means because we've, we've scaled, we are scaling so rapidly, but there is now momentum and rhythm in the scaling. And so I, I, I can very clearly map out probably for the next three years what that what those hires are going to look like. And so when people join the waiting list, I can sort of map them into where I think they would sit and then start start the process of doing that. There is a recruitment crisis, but I'd say as well as a recruitment crisis, there's almost an exceptional employer's crisis. Um, lots and lots of people are, the customer is always right, pay the minimum, not over and above. Like our benefits package is exceptional, but it's not what, it, it's not different to what everybody should be doing. So next week we're flying out to Mallorca. So we go on an all-inclusive holiday to Mallorca every year as a team again lots of accountants would be like what the bloody hell why um actually i have an employee waiting list of 120 people which means we've scaled from zero to a million pounds with not one single penny spent on recruitment fees so actually if it costs five six grand to take the team on holiday for a year i'm still up i'm still winning and then not even considering the content that is created the storytelling that is created and the awareness that is created through even being on the holiday that is then literally attracting people who will be on next year's holiday because they have consumed the content and thought, I don't even get to go on holiday or I'm taking my annual leave to sit exams. And these people are not taking annual leave. They've got an all expenses paid holiday. They get their gym memberships paid for. They get private medical. They get a one-to-one -one personal development. They get career coaching, interview coaching. Like what? <laughs> and so... It is different. It is exceptional. It's not what everybody else shouldn't be doing. But also the one thing that we are doing that's different is appropriately prioritizing talking about it because it's a sales pitch. It is a sales pitch. It's 2023. If I was looking for a job now, oh boy, you got to sell it to me because there's a recruitment crisis. I am, I am in demand. Yeah, that's a fantastic one. I, I love that point about um, whatever the holiday costs it's still nowhere near the recruitment fees you would have paid. I think what, that's, six that's grand? phenomenal. Like, we've got a team of 18 members of staff. What? And I think as well, like people do not understand. We have a client who is like an employer specialist. It's He is a culture specialist. We've worked with him like so closely. Again, one of the best, best bits about being an accountant is the people that you work with all do incredible things. And if you're doing a great job as an accounts team, they are for you and they love helping you. So we've worked really, really closely with him. And on average to replace one member of staff costs 65% of their annual salary. So if you're taking into consideration, if you're taking into consideration that person's offboarding, the next person's onboarding, recruitment fees, disruption to the team, clients that you might lose because they built up a relationship with that person, training the next person, going through all of the administration costs that are associated with that person, 65% of one person's annual salary to replace one person. My payroll bill is more than half a million pounds. That is expensive. Actually, if I'm paying 10% above the market rate for that role, they know they couldn't get that anywhere else. They wouldn't want to get it anywhere else. We've got hybrid working, flexi working, work from anywhere, workations. I'm just mitigating that risk. Like if I was gambling, I'd much rather spend my money here, keep the team, keep the staff, keep them happy, keep the clients happy than lower the rates and then have to just repeatedly, repeatedly be replacing people. And it's crazy. We've, we've now also got to the point where we've got that employee waiting list of 120 and I now do outward recruitment to place members of my audience who aren't appropriate to work with me to work with other practices. And I've now monetized that. That's fantastic. I was going to ask that question, actually, if, you, if you'd thought about that. Um, I think something you mentioned there, you talk about how much your wage bill is and you've been incredibly open. Um, I would say probably to some people scarily open about your expenditure as a business what you spend like yeah. i watch some of your videos around that and it's fascinating but also that level of openness and vulnerability it just it's like talking about salaries right people don't talk about money or salaries yeah. and, and and i've just been away with a friend and he's looking for a job and like we don't really even talk about the money side of, of, of that because it's, it's an awkward uncomfortable conversation perceived to be yet you're really clear and really open with that 100%. I guess, I guess th there's a why question. What what does that what benefit does that equate to? But also, kind of, 
how do you become that comfortable being that comfortable talking about those things oh okay multiple questions first question um how do you get comfortable i always say like humans are nosy i'm nosy right the reason we all consume content is we're all window watching into other people's lives um i'm i'm really nosy i'm one of those people that has a drama free life but if it's happening to somebody else we just have a cup of tea what the bloody hell's going on over there everybody is nosy one of the best bits about being an accountant is you have access to and you are very often the first and sometimes the only external person that is let into people's businesses sometimes you are let into people's businesses in a way that even their spouse isn't it's so intimate and I learn more and I am a better business owner because I see how other businesses operate it doesn't have to be in my industry it could be nothing to do with my industry sometimes those are the ones where you learn the most you just get an extra layer of insight into the way that other people operate their businesses and it's incredible so that's the first reason um is I know how much it's impacted me being able to see that as an accountant and so actually as an accountant, I can't let the general public into my clients, but I can let them into our business. And so I started the short form series, what I spent this week, business owner edition. Um, second point is it's now sponsored. So it's now what I spent this week, business owner edition powered by QuickBooks. So QuickBooks pay uh, me to create weekly content that I was creating anyway. Spoiler alert. I've been running the series for about six months where every single week I let people inside my bank reconciliation. Um, QuickBooks are now sponsoring that. And so there's no extra workload. It's one extra powered by QuickBooks, three extra words in every video. So now it's monetized. Um, and thirdly, I said it before, every single thing we do is intentional. We put our money where our mouth is. We spend a lot of money on employee well-being, and we get so many questions. So I think last week I recorded one where we just hired, we hired a party bus to take us from the airport to the all-inclusive uh, hotel in Mallorca. And so to be able to share that, like it would feel weird if I was creating content that was literally just like, hey guys, just wanted to let you all know that I've just hired a party bus. Actually, it's so much more organic and so much more at every single touch point, I am affirming we are spending, we are spending, we are spending. You are important to us. They are important to us. I don't just say those things. You can literally see it going out on my bank statement, whether it's somebody's gym membership, private medical, gifts for people. We do fun Fridays when somebody joins, we give them a budget to spend money on stuff. Actually, it is every single touch point is an affirmation of we either spend money in these places to provide an enhanced service to our clients, whether that's our CRM platform, whether that's tax advisory services, whether that's let us pay for your zero and your QuickBooks so you only get one invoice from us a month all the way through to a party bus in Mallorca. And then wider than that, it is so educational. The amount of clients who have come to us and referenced, I didn't know you could claim private medical. How can I claim private medical? Or it's me saying, oh, whoops, that's a personal expense. Just going to post that to my DLA. And someone comes back and says, is that what a director's loan account is? Because I accidentally spend money on the wrong card all the time. And so... I feel like now we're really getting down to it and you can see like at a fundamental core level, not only is every single thing intentional, but nearly every single piece of content does more than one job. That is a situation where I have monetized it. I'm educating my clients. I'm attracting new members of staff and I'm working with a brand that is a household name that then increases my position of authority within the industry. So that's just one piece of content every single week that does five different jobs. Um, yeah, do you know, I, I, it's, it's something I, I talk about a lot and I, it's something that for me, I think is devastating in this country that we, we sit there in, in schools and we focus on, on mathematics and stuff like that, that we, that people generally never use, but we don't talk to people about what a credit card is or, or how to get a mortgage or what APR is. And so I think the financial, the whole financial education of this, this country is, is a mess. And we used to say when I worked at a business previously that you know people generally business owners don't get into business to run a business they get in because they do they enjoy what they do which means sometimes the financial side of it can be they might not have the best grip of that um so yeah so I, I totally get that and I've watched that and I'm, I'm learning stuff and I yeah. learn stuff about it 
one, one question I've, I've got to ask this way is there ever a point where james turns around to you and goes don't share that <laughs> you, you've done too much today that's too much <laughs> or, or 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 actually is he just like no that's fine <laughs> I, okay. I have to ask that question right because you run the business together so i just ever wonder if sometimes he sits there because he's very much like behind the camera most yeah. of the time right yeah, so yeah. yeah so just just a just a question i was not to ask um common misconception is that because people perceive to be consuming every aspect of your life it means that you're showing every aspect of your life james and i are very private well uh, we got married last year and we eloped just the two of us because that's very much our normal organic happy place is just the two of us uh so common misconception you're seeing everything spoiler alert you're not um there are things that we don't share so we have recently started sharing payroll bills every single month but again they're all grouped and sort of distorted yeah. in that way we're not sharing things like corporation tax figures uh vat bills things like that so um yeah and as as with everything that we do again it comes back to that intentionality we've spoken about it quite a lot i had a situation last year where we went very very viral uh it ended up in a in a tv appearance for me so we had a client who is an only fans content creator if you don't know what that is don't google it i'll let you know uh, it, it is adult short <laughs> yeah, and don't normal. don't google it don't on google your work it. pc definitely not, not a on good your work idea. pc and not in front of your spouse only fans is uh, an on-demand content platform for adult content um and so we have a client that does OnlyFans content and they approached us and said, can I expense a boob job? We said, absolutely not. No, you can't. And they said, well, actually, I've been reading the guidance and there are a couple of cases where a musician has needed some work done on their hands in order to continue working. Um, I can actually prove that my income will go up as a direct result of it. And so it would have been really easy to... I had that conversation on a podcast earlier this year I think it was February and so it would have been really easy to assume that I a young tiny blonde female accountant had just stumbled into a podcast recording studio and decided to disclose on that day something that happened that week the reality is that um my rule on social media is that we share scars not open wounds and so 12 months had actually passed from the point that we did that piece of advisory work all the way through to actually talking about it before, during and after those conversations, we were working very, 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 very closely with uh, AAT and ACCA. We had an internal investigation and we actually asked them to do a technical review of the work that we'd done from a tax and compliance perspective, start to finish. Um, they're actually really impressed and really happy with the work that we did. And so we actually went to our governing bodies and said, we actually think there's a really great educational talking piece here about how the fact that it's 2023, people aren't generating income in conventional ways. And actually, it's almost shining a spotlight on sometimes how hard our job is as accountants to we are just interpreting rules that very often weren't built for the environment that we live in now. And so we worked really, really hard with the uh, internal standards team and the compliance team at AAT and ACCA as as well as lots and lots of PR and media training which was came in very very handy because we did decide to talk about it on a podcast and then it went so viral um that was my first TV appearance and so again I think it would have been really easy to look at that from the outside and think that I just decided to talk about it one day whereas actually like nobody ever sees how much goes into it behind the scenes and how much there are things that you want to go viral for and things that you don't. We knew talking about that would have a virality, clickbaity headline aspect to it. And actually, we've had so much incredible feedback from people who consume that content, from people who that's how they, how they found us for the first time and actually prioritizing financial education, using it as an opportunity to sort of expose that mainstream media exposure that you've got access to and start bringing in fi finances into the conversation. And we attracted a huge amount of new clients who do not feel listened to by their accountant because the main hook that they took from that story was you listen to her. That's fantastic. Yeah, you, we, we've talked about this on stage a couple of times and it's definitely always a, always a topic of conversation that gets people's um, uh, attention. And, and you're right, like the, 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 when the rules were written, the world was a very different place and the world has how people monetize people don't monetize businesses as much sometimes they monetize themselves and, and mm -hmm. they are their business so that whole that whole piece is so important um one thing I, I i definitely would be remiss if i didn't talk about was um 
kind of the impact you've had on disability and, and ability in the industry. And I think that's so important because Accountex, I think I'm right in saying Accountex was the first event that had that in this industry that, that had a British sign language person at a lot of the talks, right? And that was driven a lot by you because you are um, profoundly deaf. And uh, not that uh, you'd ever, anyone would ever know. And, and like, <laughs> there's so many questions I, I, I have about that, but I, we, we don't have forever. I could dive into just how, how that is just a thing that is, but I want to talk about the impact that you've had on um, disability and ability within the industry because it's been huge, it's been profound. How has being profoundly deaf impacted you in this? And how have you turned that into something that, that has started to change the industry again in a different way? Um, the BSL is a really good starting point. So I was the first speaker to ever push back on an organization that was providing talks and, and said, actually, what are you doing about accessibility at this event? So the only BSL interpreter that's ever appeared in the UK was funded by me because I didn't want to speak without having accessibility incorporated into that. Um, again, now that conversation and that bias is is changing. And so actually, Accountex, DAS, um, Accounting Web, they're all now setting up panels while they're planning the event to work out how does neurodiversity fit into this event? How does having a, a, a sight impairment fit into this event? How does being profoundly deaf fit into this event? Um, again, as a speaker, I'll ask you a question, Phil. Has anyone ever taught you how to make presentations accessible? Probably not. No, and and beyond that, I when when we were having our panel at Accountex this year, knowing that you were on there, prompted me to ask a question that I've never asked before. And the question was, is there anything I need to do to enable or to support you on the panel? Yeah. And I'd never thought about asking that question. Now I'm, I'm, I'm dyslexic. Um, so my, I have like that slight, I call it a slight disability, right? It's, it's not something that impacts me on a daily basis too much, but it's there and it, it's constant, but it's not prevalent at events or something like that. But I, it made me really super conscious as someone that that, that, that that even has a level of neurodiversity that I didn't even think about that in terms of the wider piece. So that was the impact it had on me is it made me ask the question, which I've 100%. never done before. And it was just amazing, like Accountex London, um, the BSL interpreter, I use his name is Martin. He's incredible. He is a part-time BSL interpreter, part-time drag queen. And I just absolutely love him. Uh, like people were literally crying, like, to just see BSL is so impactful and you don't have to be hard of hearing to actually have a visual representation of some people sit in those audiences and are experiencing this talk in a very different way to you. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done in terms of speakers. So whenever I do a, a speaking event, I have a QR code on screen, which if you scan, you can see my slides up close. If you're partially sighted, you can have a live transcript on your phone. So before I do any event, I practice. I then transcribe the practice talk and then you can watch those subtitles come up in real time at the same time that I'm talking. As speakers, very often we're not taught how to do that. And it's literally because I've sort of like fumbled my way around and thought, oh, do you know what that talk, do you know what would have made that talk better? This year I went to DAS where the only option to listen to people speak was through headphones, which I can't wear. So I was there as a speaker, not able to engage in any of the content that was available, which was really, really hard. It doesn't go away. I think there's a long way to come at Accountex this year before I was speaking. Uh, I was on two different panels that day and both of the panels, every other member of the panel was wearing a, a wearable, I call them the Britney mics, uh, over the head Britney mic. I had a handheld because I wear hearing aids and somebody came up to me before the talk and said, what's up? Don't want to mess your hair up. Like this is, Ooh. it doesn't go away. And for some reason, people feel like it's appropriate to to make make comments it doesn't make it easier um i'd much rather take it than have somebody who's a bit more um you know less confident in in their abilities than me it is hard it doesn't go away it's invisible and so it actually relies on you constantly over communicating your needs but it, yeah to have a comment like what's wrong don't want to mess your hair up um also like right before you're about to go on stage and deliver a talk about yourself is is quite hard uh 
I, I li- when you said that, I literally gasped. I yeah. like, I was like, oh, that's 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 horrible on so many levels. I mean, not only is it ableist, it's also sexist, and, yeah. and like, like it, it just it ticks all the wrong boxes, and exactly not what you need to go on. And I, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, like as someone that that has a, a disability, but also someone that is, and you've described yourself, so I'm going to use your words as yeah, a do. young young female account, like like you're you're dealing with this stuff every day right and i'm guessing that, that that whilst a lot of what you get online is positive i'm guessing you probably get the occasional dm that isn't i'm guessing that when you put an article on certain websites there's the there's the standard That's level of website. comments yeah i mean like i, I yeah um i i spoke to the the, the, the great late and uh, much missed john stockdike uh, around the comment section on certain websites and and he said and he did say it's in, it's still important to keep them even if they don't the, it doesn't go right because it still enables that conversation and and does actually does does a better job of highlighting how much the industry needs to do but even so sometimes it's it's brutal so so all of that you still maintain positivity and you still maintain this amazing outward kind of confident persona but it must comments like that that you got at context that must have hurt and it must kind of still kind of make you feel that the industry's got so much distance to cover to get to where it needs to be yeah yeah 100 percent. and and i am a hugely i'd say borderline annoying positive like defaultly just positive personality type um i'm definitely like a visionary as opposed to a realist and i choose actively choose sometimes very actively choose to maintain that positive uh, outlook I put that energy I, I literally could spend energy thinking about that and think why as a young female is the first go-to question of choice you don't you want to mess your hair up uh, rather than oh did they not have any mics left or are you okay um, I do lots and lots of work with hearing dogs for deaf people lots of work with the National Deaf Children's Society actually to simply showcase how accessible accountancy is as a career uh, lots of the articles that I write online are about how we can all incorporate accessibility into our roles as practice owners. As clients, we attract lots and lots of clients who have uh, communication preferences, whether that is out of choice or out of disability. And so we've been able to use that as a way to just make finance more accessible for everybody. But it, it is really hard. It is something that I guess will be be around forever. Uh, I don't think you'll be able to stop comments like that. But again, I'm old enough and ugly enough to know that comments like that are not a reflection on me. It's actually a reflection on the person it's coming from. So, Absolutely. So look, final question. And, and genuinely, this has been such an interesting conversation. We've covered such a, a wide depth of, of topics. Um, what's the one piece of advice you would give to event organisers and industry bodies and, and people putting together something like a panel or like a talk so they can better support people with different needs and different abilities because you've covered it right it's like it's not just people with with hearing issues it's people with sight issues it's people with neurodiverse issues that may be flashing so so what would you say would be a good starting point or piece of advice for those people when they're getting going in planning those events The best bit of advice, and I say this to Caroline Hobden, I say it to Dan Cockerton all the time, the best bit of advice if you are planning an event and you are thinking about accessibility is you will never get it perfect for everybody. I think so many people don't know where to start and they are so scared of getting it wrong for one person that actually it becomes so overwhelming. They don't know where to start and actually if you turn that boulder into smaller rocks and you ask for help and you treat it in a very human human way, actually, you know, going to DAS and there being headphones only just gives us opportunities to improve. And actually it could be that they've thought of everybody else, just they weren't able to meet that need. And so from someone with a disability, please know that you'll never get it right for everybody. But using that as a starting point and asking people for help is a great place to start.